next guest is uh, another fast web formula to success in a way. This is, uh, that was his first presentation ever. He was talking about design and conversions. And someone who I've known for a long time online uh, is our friend James. So come on up, James. I want to introduce you to everybody. James Dyson. Welcome to James. Now, he's still only a kid, <laughs> but he's generated over a million dollars in the last 12 months between Fast Web Formula 2 and now with software. How cool is that? Yeah. So, in fact, a long time ago we were talking about templates and stuff and I said, you've got to stop designing this stuff and you've got to build a business around it and he's done it and he's made a spectacular success from it. So this is uh, James's second ever live presentation. So I'm just going to hand over to you, have fun. Thank you. Cheers, Alrighty. Jamie. Thank you. How are you doing? Everybody doing okay? So uh, I'm going to talk about software today um, and I know a few people I've spoken to already have said that when I talk about software, they're kind of like, well, how does this apply to my business? I know a lot of you already have existing businesses in lots of different markets. So what I'm going to try and do today is talk about how you can apply software to your business. I'm also going to talk about how you can get your start with software if you're just starting out. So hopefully there'll be something for everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, so also excuse the slides. They were nice and pretty. Uh, Shramko messed them up, so there you go. <laughs> so, who am I? Contrary to popular belief, I'm nothing to do with the vacuum cleaner guy, no relation of mine, as James has mentioned many times on his uh, interviews with me and stuff like that. So I started off doing design for internet marketing. I started off doing mini sites, headers, graphics like that. A few of you in the audience I think I've done designs for in the past. Uh, obviously, James is one of my sort of you know, most regular clients when I was doing design work. And as he says, um, he was constantly saying, you know, you need to do more with this. So uh, after a while, I kind of realized that um, I needed to leverage what I was doing into some kind of an automated system or take it further because I was doing all these designs for people and I was doing quite well with it towards the end. You know, I was doing screens pages and quite high end design for people. And I kind of figured, well, you know, why can't I do a system? I was, I was selling templates already. James and I actually JV'd on a template package. But the problem with, with it was that it still required quite a lot of HTML knowledge and, and complex stuff like that. So I wanted to find a way to actually make it so people could basically um, take a design and apply it to their business really easily. So basically, after about three months of work, Optimized Press was born. This was being worked on at Fastware Formula 2. And shortly after the event, um, we launched. And in the first 10 months since launch, we did just over $1 million in sales. So it was pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there was no big guru launch, nothing like that. It was basically just a collection of affiliates. And I'll go through some of the stuff that I did to, to launch the product um, as we go through. So why, why do you want to sell software? Well, there's a few reasons. Potentially, it's the most profitable business in the world. If you look at some of the, most, the biggest companies in the world now, Apple, although they're not just a software company, you know, they were, for a couple of days this year, the biggest company in the world. Um, Microsoft, Cisco, many other companies, Facebook, you've heard of all these companies, they're all software companies, essentially. So there's a lot of potential in software. It's easy to sell. Now, that sounds a bit strange, but what I mean by that is that compared to a lot of things, there's benefits to selling software. For example, if you're selling an information product, which you know, many of you do, and it's a great business model, the problem with it is that you can tell people you've got a solution. You can have awesome copyright in which you know, many of you have learned about today, um, but you can't really demonstrate completely that you've got the solution to the problem with software. You can actually, if say someone needs an accounting package that works out all their tax for them, you can, you can basically show that on the screen to people straight away. And, you know, it's a lot more of sort of someone that sees that and they say, well, yeah, I, you know, it does exactly what I want it to do. There's no doubt there. Um, so, you know, you can sell things more easily with software. 
Um, it's also evergreen. With many information product markets, you have to kind of continue to do these launches, which, you know, a launch is a great strategy, but it's a strategy. It shouldn't be a business model. With software, if you can release um, a solid piece of software into your market, that can last for many years, and you can just you can update it, but you don't have to keep doing this launch um, to actually keep it going. You can also build in instant traffic sources into your software. So you can do things like, um, if you have a web app, you can basically um, build things into the system which alert your customers to other offers. So you don't even have to send them an email. You can actually alert them within the system. So if you're actually, uh, you've created a web app that people are using on a regular basis, you can actually have an alert there that says, check out this product. It's right there in front of them while they're using your software. And you don't even have to send them an email. It's a really effective way of communicating with your audience. Um, it's affiliate friendly as well. Um, I know many of you probably have bought Optimized Press through James's links. Uh, what you probably don't know is that, you know, James has a number of sites selling Optimized Press. <laughs> I don't know if you're why you're telling me that. But basically, he has a number of sites all selling Optimized Press because it's so easy to promote. You know, you can, you can do affiliate, uh, you can do video demos of software. You can, um, you can show people exactly what you're doing with the software yourself. You can also add value with extra training so you can teach your market how to use a piece of software you're recommending. So it's very affiliate friendly, which we, you know, the majority of our traffic comes from affiliates. So I, this, is a big, this is a big factor for me. The copy writes itself. What I mean by that is that you can have very, very simple sales copy and still sell a lot of products. The sales video for Optimized Press, which many people have said I need to redo, and I know that, um, it took me three hours to do, and it sold over a million dollars in, in sales. In fact, quite a lot more than that since. But it, it's not a big issue. You can write the software. You can just basically do feature bullets on your page, and you can sell a lot of product by, by doing that. There's no big you know, advanced sales copy that you have to do. Obviously, you can use a lot of the stuff that you've learned here to write a really effective sales letter. I could probably sell a lot more if I really worked on the copy, but it's not something you have to do. You don't have to be a programmer. This is probably the biggest objection that I hear is, you know, I don't know how to write code. I don't want to write code. And I'm not a programmer. Yeah, I was a designer, and I leveraged that uh, skill as part of the creation of Optimized Press, but I'm not a programmer. I don't know how to write a line of PHP code. I can, I can code a website to an extent, but I, I don't know how to write codes. But you, I'll show you later in this presentation how you can actually use um, outsourcing sites and various other ways to actually build software without being a programmer yourself. So this section, basically, I'm going to talk about how to generate ideas for your software. The first thing I want to talk about is what kind of software you might want to create. And there's two main categories I'm going to talk about. The first one is web-based apps. What I mean by this is an app where you basically build it on your own server or servers, and people access the, the system via a login um, onto your site. So things like Facebook, Basecamp, FreshBooks, many of you have used these systems. They're all web apps, and they're normally subscription-based. You don't have to do subscription, but because of things like the hosting costs, you probably want to make it a subscription-based product. Um, that could be looked at as a, a negative or a positive, but I would say that web apps, although Optimized Press is not a web app, it's probably the strongest way to actually develop an application. There's a few reasons for this. One of the main ones is compatibility and support. With many products, if you're offering a downloadable product, it's got its advantages, but you're going to have a lot more support because you've got to make sure it works on so many different systems. If you have a web-based app, you've essentially just got to make sure it works on the major browsers. So that's a lot more of a narrow spec that you've got to, you can basically just tell people, OK, update your browsers, and they should be good to go. So that's a major factor. And I'll come on to support a bit, bit later in the, in the presentation. The other option is downloadable apps, which Optimized Press fits into this. Many other apps, Market Samurai, I think some of the Market Samurai guys are here. Um, you know, the usual apps that we use every, every day, most of these are downloadable apps. And you know, downloadable apps, it's a, gr it's a great system also. The, um, the problem with downloadable apps, as I've said, is the support issue with compatibility with so many different systems. And, um, you know, that's a, that's a major issue as far as support 
is concerned. So you, you've kind of got to weigh the, the pros and cons up against what, what you want to do with your software. Um, the other thing with downloadable apps is you can sell it as a one-time payment because you haven't got to host anything. You can just give them the software. Um, so that is an advantage. We use that as an advantage against some of our competitors when we launched Optimize Press. But you know, you've got to look at what else is in your market and then see where you can actually fit your software into, into that. Okay, mobile apps. I'm not really going to talk about mobile apps too much today. I know it's a popular and a hot topic. It's not something I've really done, so I don't feel that I really want to you know, go too far into that because I don't have a lot of experience in that market. So uh, mobile apps are great. There's, it's a huge growing market. The thing with mobile apps is obviously um, you, know, you just need to see what's hot right now because many of these mobile apps that are being released, essentially you'll see one mobile app, for example, on the, on the iPhone, and it will do a certain thing. A few weeks later, you'll see pretty much the same app under a different name. And this is because people just see what's in the top 20 or top 50 apps, and they'll just create their own version of it with, with their own tweak. And that's a great model if you're going to do iPhone and iPad apps and things like that. It's not really my model, so um, I'm not really going to talk about that too much today. OK, in your um, workbooks, there's a couple of pages. For some reason, they're not consecutively ordered. but Page 28 and page 33, I think it is. Yeah, um, you've got some ideas to get you started with software. Um, there's just a few ideas in there, just to sort of give you an idea of what kind of things you could create. And um, I would have a look through that, see what, see what, um, anything that jumps out at you. And basically, you should just use this as a basis for your own ideas. Don't just pick one out of there if you're going to start creating your own product. You can also look at things like ClickBank. I know there's a lot of bad things to be said about ClickBank, but you can still, it's, it's an open marketplace, and you can see what's selling by look at the gravity of a product. It's basically a, an indicator of the, pro, the popularity of a certain, um, a certain product. And basically, you can see from that whether or not this is an, a market or a product that you want to kind of go up against or whether you want to create your own version of that. James, have we got the times coming up? Um, so have a look through there. And what I also want to talk about is the, basically some other ways that you can generate ideas. So basically, one of the main things you want to look at if you're creating software is what you can automate for your market. So is there something that you can automate and create into a system and sell as a software in your market? And that's really the easiest way to find a software idea. So you can also look at what you're, selling, what you're already doing internally in your business. So if you have software systems in your business already, you can look at how you can take those and create like a, an external version of it for, for, um, for sort of a, a customer, basically. So um, that's a great way to come up with some ideas for software. Um, just bear with me. OK. So this is an example. Um, some of you who were here last year will have seen Corey Boatwright speak. And um, this is just an example of how he applied software to his business. So he has uh, an automation system called the short sale automator. Corey, for any of you who don't know, is big in sort of real estate and the short sale market over in the States. Um, and this is a software that he created, which he charges 997 for a one-time fee plus $97 a month. And I believe this is a multi-million uh, dollar profit center on its own for his business. So it just gives you an idea of the potential of adding software. He has an info product business as well, but this is a, another sort of profit center in his business. So you can see the potential that software can bring to your own business. OK. Now, there's also in your workbook the qualifying software checklist. And I'm just going to go through a couple of those things quickly. Uh, basically, this is the list that we use in our business before we're assessing new ideas. We're, we're coming up with a few new software ideas at the moment, and this is the list that we use to kind of assess them. The first thing that we look at is basically whether there's a market leader. So if you were going to go and create a productivity uh, tool, uh, like project management tool, sorry, like Basecamp, if, if you ever say to someone, you know, what should I use for managing my team and managing projects? The majority of people in this room are probably going to say Basecamp. Um, 
So if you're going to go into that market, well, I wouldn't basically because it's, it, there's one solid market leader there. Now, if you go into a market and you say, well, what's the main product? And people are kind of giving you different ideas, different answers, then it's probably okay because if someone hasn't established themselves as the market leader, then you've still got a chance to, to get in there and actually establish yourself as one of the, the, the go-to people for that, that marketplace. You also want to check that there's not too many free pieces of software that do what you're proposing your software might do. If there's loads of free stuff out there, it's going to be harder to sell a paid product in that market, obviously. Um, you also want to make sure that it's obviously a passionate market. The same things apply if you're trying to find a niche. Um, you know, if, if you're already in a market and you know there's a need for this. One thing you can do, which is a little bit sneaky, but if you've already found competitors in your marketplace and you're thinking of creating software, and they, they've already got software out there, have a look at their help desks, because many help desks have a feature request section, and they also have a section on um, like problems with their system. So you can have a look at that and instantly see what, where they're falling down for their customers. And you can, you can basically just take that list and make sure that every single feature that people are asking for, or at least the ones that, you, that look like they're getting a lot of feedback, um, you, know, you can take those ideas and actually put them into your software, and instantly you've got an advantage over them. You, can also, you, you also want to look at if you can get cheap traffic. Um, Jens talks about awesome ways to get traffic from Facebook. And you know, there's, there's other methods. I would recommend just taking James's traffic gab system and just taking a few of those strategies and just seeing if you can apply them to your business uh, and get traffic for this. And obviously, you know, really, I think most markets you can get cheap traffic now if you just know where to look and how to, how to do it. So that's one thing. Um, basically, that's the main checklist that we look at. The, the one other thing we do look at sometimes is if there's something like, I think I gave the example of the, the audio recording product. If there's a product, for example, an audio recorder, and you're thinking about doing that, but that's quite saturated, you could look at creating something specifically for a part of the market. For example, audio recorders for Skype, there's a product called Pamela out there, and that's pretty much the leader in that market because there's not really anything else out there. There's audio recorders, but nothing that does it specifically for Skype. So you can look at how, if you can't create a product that's just general for your market like that, take something more specific and apply it to, to that uh, part of the, uh, the market. So the software plan, basically what I want to talk about is how you can get more profits out of your software, um, less refunds, and things to protect your ideas, basically. So one of the first things to do um, is ensure that when you're building software, you build support into it. And what I mean by that is that you can use things like tool tips, which is like when you hover over something, you get a little bubble that comes up. And your programmer can do all this. I'll explain how, to, you, know, how you can outsource this later, but these are the things you want to tell your programmer to include. So you want to have things like tool tips or some kind of instant help system within the actual software. So if you have um, a feature, you want a little button that says, like, need help, click here, or a little question mark, things like that. We built this into a, a later version of Optimize Press, and we're refining it even more at the moment. Um, but as soon as we did that, we reduced our support by 20 to 30 percent. So it's, it's significant as far as helping customers help themselves with your software, as well as training that you want to provide. You want to try and help them while they're in the system. You want to build alerts into the system, and I touched on this before, so you can actually notify your customers of updates, and you also can notify them of other products you might be offering and things like that. This is a big one because if you build it in from the start, it's going to be a lot easier to um, do that than actually add it in later. Now, if you're offering a downloadable product, you want to make sure that you build in an auto-update system, if at all possible. It can cause issues. I mean, we have an auto-update system in Optimize Press now. It works pretty well, although if someone's customized the system, then we have to kind of, there's things we have to do there. You can never make it 100%, but the, for the majority, it works great, and it saves a lot of time, customer support, um, because people can just click a button and update it to the latest version. It also means that if you fix bugs, you're not having to constantly email people out and say, oh, we fixed another bug. Here's download the update from the website. Because you know, if you want to be emailing people, it's great to email them with new features, but you don't really want to be emailing them every day saying, oh, we've got another bug in the system, because people are just going to get pissed off with you after a while. So. Licensing system, this is again applying to um, downloadable products. One of the advantages with web apps 
you don't really have to do this because you can just have a login and it's secure. People can't really rip off your software as easily. If you've got a downloadable system, a uh, downloadable product, then licensing is really something you want to have. Um, we built the licensing system for Optimized Press for around about 500 bucks. We found someone on Odesk to do it. It's not, it's not um, you know, at the end of the day, if someone wants to crack your software, they're going to crack it. There's nothing you can do. But it's a deterrent, and it helps push people through. If you're, if you're offering a one-user license, and you have a license system that says, OK, you've you got one, a single-user license or multi-user, by having this licensing system, that's going to ensure that they buy another copy. If they're going to do client sites or whatever, then you're going to push them through and make more money out of it, basically. Now, there's a few ways you can easily add value to your product, depending on what you've created. One of the best ways that we've discovered recently is a site called CodeCanyon.net. And basically, it's a site, a repository of codes and scripts that you can, you can buy to use. But you can also buy an extended license to many of these scripts for a couple of hundred bucks, sometimes less. Now, it's not worth always plugging in something for no apparent reason into your software, but if you've got a piece of software there and it's going to benefit by an additional feature, you can go on Code Canyon and you can look at plugins, things like that. So if you're building a WordPress theme, you could build in some, some codes from a plugin into your WordPress theme to add additional functionality for almost no additional work on your own part. Some programmers don't like to do this because they like to have all the code as their own, but, you know, this is one way that you can, if you find the right programmer, you can actually get this, um, you can add stuff in with minimal extra cost on your own part. I want to talk about the Apple effect for a second. Um, what I mean by this is you need to find a way of making your software um, something really new and cool in the market because before Apple came along, there were still MP3 players. There was, there was MP3 players were still being sold. You know, Apple weren't the first people with the iPod. But what they did was they made it new, they made it fresh, they made it funky. They did things differently to sell it, you know, with these cool-looking ads, and they got U2 on to do, you know, all these kind of things that they did to distinguish themselves as sort of a new, new player in the market. And that basically, it made people look at their products and go, oh, that's really cool, I want to, I want to use that. You want to try and think of a way to do that in your market. You can't always do it. But if you can think of a way to distinguish yourself and make something unique, then this is, this is a great way to differentiate yourself from your competitors. So things like good design, if you have a great design um, web page selling your software, we, with Optimized Press, we went a diff slightly different way to the standard sales page with our software. We, we tweaked things. We actually emulated some of the Apple websites. Some of you might have seen the sales page, and we emulated some of their pages with sort of screenshots within the, um, within sort of the Apple monitors and things like that. And a lot of people have said to us, you know, I really like that. That really drew me into your site. Um, and I'm sure it's resulted in quite a few sales because we look different to just a standard plain old sales page. So if you can do things like that, look at what your competitor's doing and try and do something a bit different. It's a great way to, um, to basically build, build, boost sales. You can also do this with the user experience. So I'm sure... I think James asked, how many people are you on Max? Yeah, so basically, one of the big draws for myself, and I'm sure for many of you, was the user experience on a Mac is just so much more improved than on a PC. It's so much easier. I know not everyone agrees with that, but um, this was a big selling factor for them. You know, they made things so easy, so fresh looking. Um, so if you can actually build a user interface for your software that's really fresh, it's really easy to use. Look at what your competitor's doing. The majority of software out there is clunky and hard to use. If you can really simplify things, you can actually, again, gain an audience share by making your software easier, simpler, quicker to use than your competitors. OK, so how do we go about actually creating your software? So as I said before, you don't need to know how to code. I as I said, I've got a little bit of design experience. I know how to design graphics and stuff. Not big on websites and things like that. So I did this, so I'm pretty sure all of you can. Um, so here's what we do with the development plan, basically. This is what we use, the tools and the systems. So we use Basecamp for team and project management. I've already mentioned Basecamp. I'm sure James, if you've listened to any of his webinars or 
anything, you, you're familiar with Basecamp. It's just the easiest way to manage your team and manage projects. We use Evernote or Things for uh, notes and ideas. So basically, Evernote is a free web app. You, there is a premium version, but you, we still use the free version. And basically, that allows you to make notes in little notebooks and folders on your, on your laptop. It's PC and Mac compatible. And it also syncs to your iPad and your iPhone. So I use that for any notes and ideas I've got, any discussions that I have with people before we put it into Basecamp. It goes into, um, into, it goes into Evernote. Things is another one. Things is, um, some, I actually switched from things. I do still like things, but I just found that Evernote, the syncing ability with that, made it a winner for me. OK, you'll probably want to wireframe some ideas out. now. You may not want to do this if you're completely design, you know, if you hate design and you don't even want to have any input on your software. But if you do want to wireframe some ideas out, there's a couple of tools that I use, both actually in Keynote. There are some um, web apps as well. Um, I'll find the links and then we'll put them on the, the website with the resources and things. But there's a couple of um, sites here. And these are basically kits that you can download for Keynote, which allow you to wireframe different kinds of applications and things right within Keynote, really easy to use. I also swipe a lot of ideas and screenshots as part of the development process. So I use Skitch, which is a free app which has now been bought by Evernote, and that basically allows you to instantly take screenshots, and you can actually just click a button, and it will give you a link to actually view that image anywhere in the world on a, on a web browser. So it's really great if you're having a conversation with your developer and you want to say, look, I want to do something like this. You can just use Skitch, take a screenshot. Instantly, you can send them the link in Skype, and they can actually see what you're seeing, and you, know, you, you pass the idea on. I also use Little Snapper, which is, I think it's a Mac app. Um, and that's great for sort of archiving lots of screenshots. So I organize into different sort of swipes of different sites that I've seen, ideas that we've seen. Um, and it's just a little bit more um, in depth than Stitch, Skitch, but you can use them both alongside each other. And we also use, um, well, PC users will want to use Snagit, which is basically the equivalent. It's n it is on Mac as well, but I don't think the Mac version is as polished. Um, so I'd recommend the top two if you're on Mac, bottom one if you're on PC. OK, so there's a few different development models if you're actually building your software. First one is the partner model. This might be the, the best one for you if you're just getting started and you want to get your software out there as quickly as possible, but you, you don't mind about sort of sharing a bit of the equity of your software. So basically, with the, with the partner model, you're essentially finding a developer and you're sharing your idea with them, and they're going to take a cut of the profits we're from the software, but they're going to basically do their develop the development for free for you. So you're going to do the marketing, and they're going to do the development, and you partner up on this. Now, it's obviously you've, you've got to go through checking um, the person you choose. You've really got to sort of check their background and do the usual sort of um, due diligence that you would do before you hired anyone. The same process applies for partnering up with someone. But you can often find web developers and coders on forums and places like that that are keen to have their own business but don't really have any marketing knowledge. You guys have all got you know, awesome marketing skills and information that you've got from events like this. So you can do that side of it. You've got the idea, and you take that to them, and between you, you develop it. And you can generally get to market quicker if you partner. We didn't do this with Optimized Press, but a couple of things that we're working on now are actually partnership uh, projects. And you know, the only downside really is that you're having to share some of the profits. You can outsource locally. So this is another thing that we're doing more of now. We originally outsourced to the Philippines, and Optimized Press was built um, by someone in the Philippines. I'll come on to the advantages and disadvantages of that in just a moment. But outsourcing locally is essentially outsourcing to Australia, the USA, or the UK. So English speaking as their sort of first language. Um, the reason that this is probably better, it's more expensive, but you do generally find that with people that you outsource to locally, you don't have to um, explain things as much to them. They use more initiative than if you're, in the, if you're using the Philippines or India and places like that. So 
if you're outsourcing locally, it's going to cost you more money, but you're probably going to get um, a result with less hand-holding. Outsourcing overseas, so Philippines and India are great places for outsourcing overseas. You're going to have to do more hand-holding with this, so you're going to have to project manage a lot more. I basically took three months out to focus on Optimized Press, and that's all I did because I was literally just making sure that um, everything was, went smoothly. But the development cost me about five grand, so the trade-off was probably worth it. <laughs> but um, you know, if you haven't got the time to do this, if, you, if you've got a business already, then you're probably going to look at outsourcing locally or the partnership model, whereas if you're basically just starting out, then you could look at overseas to cut your costs. Um, but you need to know what you want, and you need to really guide those people overseas because they're probably not going to um, you know, just use their initiative quite as much. So where do you outsource to? If you're outsourcing locally, these are three of the best sites for finding people. They are professional job boards, so this is where sort of the web development professionals hang out, and a lot of big companies will also post jobs on these, but you can post jobs, freelance section, and find people on there which will perfectly be willing to take up your projects. So I, can you read those all right? Um, okay, that's fine. Um, Odesk, oh sorry, so authenticjobs.com is the first one, uh, jobs.smashingmagazine.com and jobs.freelancewitch.com is the third. You can also just search for professional job boards and you'll find, um, you'll find a, a number of sort of job listing sites there, for, but these are basically three of the top ones. Everyone got those? Okay, Odesk. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Odesk, one of the most popular outsourcing sites. We found our original developer on Odesk, and he was okay. Um, the good thing with Odesk is that you can actually allows you to see what people are doing on their screens when you're paying them for their time. So you can pay them hourly, or you can pay them with a project fee, but you, it allows you a bit more monitoring, which, you know, it's not 100%, but it gives, it's more incentive for them to actually make sure they're doing the work rather than just you know, down the pub or out with their girlfriends or wives. Um, so, Odesk is a good one. And what I would advise you to do if you find someone on Odesk, take, give them a small part of the project. Don't ha never hand the whole thing off to them at once. Give them a small part of the project and then see how they do with that. And then if they're doing good, if you think, you know, things are going well, pull them away from Odesk so you get outside of the Odesk fees and things like that. I always pay my programmers with PayPal, and I normally make sure that when I post a project, um, or when I, when I start conversing with them, I make sure that they're able to be paid by PayPal, because I find it's just the easiest, and we just send a mass payment to them every, every two weeks normally. Bestjobs.ph is actually a paid um, subscription site, which basically lists people in the Philippines. It's about 49 bucks a month. Um, but you can find people on here. Uh, again, you're probably going to have to handhold these people more. But if you want Filipino um, workers, this is a pretty good site to look at. And then Craigslist Manila. I've had limited success with this, but it is, you know, it's free to post on there. Um, you can post jobs, and you can also find people advertising on here. But generally, people on here are less tech savvy, so you know, I wouldn't really look on there unless you really it's a last resort. Okay, so what to look for. So it really depends on the software you're developing. Um, if you're developing a web app, then you probably want to look at someone with PHP skills or um, you know, those kind of programming languages. If you're developing a WordPress theme, then you want to look at WordPress, obviously. As, and you want to make sure that, specifically, they have experience developing WordPress themes um, not just customizing WordPress themes, because I found this a lot when we were trying to find people to um, work on Optimized Press. The first two people we found were basically great at customizing sites and customizing WordPress themes. They couldn't create a theme from scratch. So you need to specifically ask, have you created a theme from scratch, or have you developed a web app from scratch? Can you give me examples? You know, the common due diligence, but these kind of things are going to save you a lot of time when you come to actually hire someone. Obviously, look at reviews and ratings on outsourcing sites, which is why it's good to start on a site like Odesk, because you can see their reviews and feedback from other customers and people that have used them in the past. Um, OK, so protecting your software idea. So when you're outsourcing 
you're obviously worried that you're going to give away your idea to someone. The thing is that most of these people are programmers. They're not actually marketers. They don't know shit about actually how to get a product to market. So it's not really something you need to worry about. But as standard, we make sure that people sign an NDA agreement that we have. Um, and we also make sure that, as I said before, we don't give away everything at the start. Don't give away the whole farm. Never post your whole job, your whole software idea to Odesk, because there are people that scour those sites looking for ideas um, for their own software, which is one thing you could do if you wanted. But <laughs> um, so, ne you know, don't post your whole idea on there. Just post fairly vague, but make sure you know you, you once you get people coming in, because you'll probably get quite a few bids for your project. Um, it, start asking more detailed questions once you, once you start to interview people. Okay, so preparing for the launch of your software. So you've now got your software created and you're looking to actually launch it. So there's a few things you want to do before you actually launch. This is basically the tech setup that we use. Um, some of you might be familiar with this, but this is um, basically what we use. So shameless plug for Optimize Press. <laughs> If you don't have it, this makes it quite easy to actually create sales pages, squeeze pages, and stuff like that. So if you want to create a sales page for your software and you want to use, you want to use WordPress, then Optimize Press makes it quite easy. There are other solutions out there. Um, Nanocast, this is basically what we use to handle our whole, um, the whole basically system for Optimize Press as far as taking payments and managing affiliates. And affiliates is a big one. I know James uses Nanocast. Um, Corey, who I mentioned earlier, also uses Nanocast. Um, it's, it's, the system itself is a little bit ugly. I think a few people who use it will agree with me on that. But once you get past that, it is a powerful system. Their affiliate tracking is awesome. Uh, Infusionsoft, not so easy. So I would go with Nanocast. And you know, it's, it, it's, never, it's not really failed us. Um, and we've done you know, well over a million dollars in, in our cart. I know other people in the audience have done probably quite a lot more than that. Um, so Nanocast is, is something I would truly recommend that you, you, you use. You want to get a PayPal or a merchant account. We use PayPal and PayPal Payments Pro. PayPal Payments Pro, the only difference is that it allows you to take credit card details without that person ever having to actually have a PayPal account. Um, the only disadvantage is that you do get a few chargebacks with people just paying through PayPal Payments Pro. but. It, we actually incre increased our sales by around 20% by offering PayPal Payments Pro. So it's worth looking at. And it's 20 bucks a month, so it's, it's not a bad thing to do. And that integrates straight in with N Nanocast as well. Autoresponder, obviously. I'm sure all of you have an autoresponder. If not, then go and get one. Basically, this allows you to build your list of customers or prospects if you're offering a free you know, report before people buy your product. You want to get an autoresponder. AWeber, um, eye contact, various other ones. We use AWeber. Membership system. If you want to provide like a secure members area, you can use a membership system. Nanocast actually has one built in, so you could use Nanocast. You can use something like Wishlist or um, Digital Access Pass if you want to create something in, in, um, within WordPress with the membership system. So I want to talk about where to sell your software. So where we started and where we still sell our software is basically with PayPal and Nanocast. So PayPal, um, we just created our page and we sell through the Nanocast affiliate system. So basically, Nanocast have, has a marketplace which you can get some traffic from. It's not significant, but we just basically used Nanocast combined with you know, JV partners promoting and things like that, which I'll come on to in a few slides time. Um, but this is the system we used. You can also use ClickBank. They've had a bad rap recently. Um, the advantage with ClickBank is that it's got a massive affiliate base. So you can quickly gain, if you get a few people promoting your product and the, the gravity starts to go up, affiliates will start to grab your product as soon as they see that this is rising gravity. The sites like cbengine.com, which actually monitor products for increasing gravity, and basically affiliates look on those sites and they see your product going like this, and they basically start, they'll give it a try. And if your page is promoting, you've probably got yourself a, a good affiliate. The App Store, it's not something we've tried. Um, if you're developing an app specifically for Mac, then this is the, the latest place to actually sell it. 
Um, we haven't tried it, as I say, but you can. Um, you could give that a try if you're actually selling a, a Mac-only app, but you are limiting yourself then. Obviously, if you create an app which has got a Mac version and a PC version, there's nothing to stop you, as far as I know, selling it in the App Store. Okay, so coming on to launching your software. One of the methods we used uh, is what I call high-profile integration. And this kind of came about by accident, but it was really effective. And basically what this was, um, we were approached by a, a fairly well-known internet marketer. And he asked us to do some training for his new product that he was launching. The product was Total Product Blueprint, and the guy was Brendan Bouchard, which some of you may know. He's a New York Times best-selling author. And basically, he approached us and said, will you create some training? I'm doing a product about um, creating information products. I want to train people on how to use your system uh, with my methods. So, you know, what do you think I said? He was doing a big launch. The launch ended up doing $4.6 million, and he dumped something like 2,000 people into this product. So, do you think you really want to get in front of 2,000 people who've paid two grand a piece? Um, so, yeah, we basically created training for his methods to go inside his members area. And it took, it took me probably a few days to do the videos that, that he wanted over a few weeks because he didn't have it all at once. But we've resulted in many sales from that because we basically just had a link underneath his, the videos saying, you know, if you want to use this system, he's already trained you on how to use it. It's pretty much a no-brainer for pe people to go ahead and buy your software. You can also apply this to any market, really. So if you find people who are educating your market um, on a particular method, a particular... So say, you, for example, in the, the accountancy market, um, you've got people who are training people on how to do their tax or something like that, and your software comes along and actually does a lot of that for them. You can say to people who are actually educating that market, okay, well, have a look at my software. Do you think we could train people on how to use your methods with my software? Can I put some training into your members area? A lot of people you know, are going to say yes because they want the free content. You're adding value to their software, or sorry, you're adding value to their product already, so it's, it's pretty much a no-brainer. This is an example of how the integration looked with uh, Brendan Bouchard's product. So we just basically would drop straight into his members area, and we created the videos, and the link was below that, just showing you. Um, you could click the link and buy Optimize Press, and he didn't even want an affiliate link on this, so we got 100% of each sale that he sent. Joint ventures is obviously another huge one. So, um, you know, many of our biggest affiliates just came from joint ventures that we, that we did with them. So basically, we, we just went out and found some of the leading people in the market and actually tried to get them to, um, to promote our products. There's a few ways you can do this. The best way is to actually provide them with some value first. I'm not going to go too much into joint ventures and things, so I think it's probably covered in, in Traffic Grab. Um, but you, can, you, know, you want to start the relationship by providing value to that person. Once you do that, then you know, the actual process of them promoting your product becomes a lot easier. If you look at myself and James, for example, you know, James is one of our biggest affiliates, and he, you know, we've maintained that relationship. I help him out now and again with design. As he says, we don't do design for anyone else, but I will occasionally help him out. It helps maintain our relationship. So honestly, not the only reason I do it, James. But <laughs> um, So joint ventures is a big one. Um, you know, generally, you have to give away 50%, but you're going to be giving 50% away to your affiliates anyway, so um, that's a good one. Webinars is another great one to launch your product. I'm sure if you watched last year, you will have seen a lot about webinars. Um, webinars is a great way to launch your product. Um, you can just basically, if you're doing software, it's so easy to demo your software with webinars. So I recommend you do webinars um, whenever you can. And basically, if you're going to do a webinar, keep it under one and a half hours. We tested, we haven't done many webinars, but the ones we did test found that there was a big drop off. If you do, if you go too long with webinars, um, at least the ones we did, um, people can get, people can drop off. So just demo the main features of your software. And you can do this with a JV partner. So they, their audience, they send them to your webinar sign-up page, and you can basically, 
you do the webinar. You can even do it recorded. We recorded webinars is really popular now. If you're not sure, you know, if you want to make sure there's no technical issues and things like that, you can record it, and then it, it still appears as live to, to people. But I would always, I wouldn't say it was live if it wasn't live, because I, I don't really think that's cool. Um, but webinars is still a great selling tool because it's essentially that, that scarcity environment. You, can, you normally have to offer some kind of a discount or special offer with a webinar, so it can be good initially. Um, probably wouldn't recommend you know, discounting your product all the time um, unless you really have to. Built-in viral elements. So one of the things we did with Optimize Press was we had the Powered By tag at the bottom of any site that was built by Optimize Press. Now, one of the most important things is you, you do, well, I think you should make sure that they can disable this because um, it's not cool if, you know, you're just trying to push your tag when they've paid you for a product. But we, we basically leave it on by default and then people can turn it off. They can also add their affiliate link. So at the bottom of any page, it will say powered by Optimized Press and that link goes straight back to our site. So you get instant free traffic from that. Um, and it's a great way to build like a viral element into your page, especially if it's any kind of a page building tool, if it's any kind of a tool which people use to output something to the web, um, or you know, if, if it's like an invoicing tool, you could have uh, you know, some kind of tag on the bottom of that. Anything like that where you can build in some kind of viral element can be quite powerful. Um, any kind of plugins that output something as well, you can, you can do that. So, Affiliate tools are very important. You need to try and give your affiliates whatever you can as far as tools. So banners, ads, maybe even Facebook ads, uh, example of Facebook ads, things like that, just to make it as easy as possible for your affiliates to promote. You know, am amaze the amount of people that just come and they'll just grab a banner and just stick it on their blog. Um, and they might, you know, they, might sell the odd, they might sell the odd copy. And if you've got 500 people doing the same thing, it's not insignificant. So make sure you provide a full set of affiliate tools. And Nanocast makes it easy to upload those into the affiliate area for your product. Integration funnels. And basically, this is where we actually... Bear with me one second. Um, so it's kind of a little bit like the uh, high-profile integration, but you just want to look at people where you can actually have your product promoted within their product or you know if, if your product fits well with their product so you're not competing in any way so say for example I had a product about how to actually a software product that actually sort of generated traffic somehow um, automated and James is selling traffic grab then that might well be a great way to say well James you know have a look at my product and you know do you think you could include it on the back end of your product somewhere give them some kind of a discount code so people are getting a unique offer from that person. So they're essentially giving value to their audience as well. And if it fits well with their audience, you're going to get a lot better conversion rate. Attend events is another good one. Um, I've been to three events in the last year and probably picked up uh, four or five of my top affiliates at these events. Now, I don't go around trying to get people to promote. I don't think that's cool, but you just build relationships, build friendships with people like in the room you are today. And just, you know, you never know who's sitting next to you at the end of the day. If you just got, get speaking to people, especially if you've met someone online and then you meet them in person, that cements that relationship a lot more. It makes it a lot easier for you to then say, well, you know, I've got this product coming out, check it out. And, Many of the people who've done that with me, I promoted them, they promoted me, and it, it works great, great as, a, as a relationship building tool. Okay, so I want to touch on a few conversion strategies based on what we've tested. Um, I'm not going to go into many. What I would say is if you want to know some good conversion strategies, check out Fast with Formula 2, where that's basically what my presentation was about. So um, I don't know if you guys have access to that or whether, um, but yeah, so that's, that was all about the stuff that we've been testing, and many of that's, m most of that still applies. There are some things that are a little bit different, but this is specifically what we've done with Optimize Press. So, not really surprising this one. Video works better than just copy. We tested this quite a lot on our page, and there was a significant difference in the conversion rate with a, a page with a video, and a page with video and copy, or a page with just copy. So, video with copy works the best, 
if you don't want to write copy, just do a video. Um, but even if you just write bullet points, like I said, that's going to that's gonna really help with your conversion rate. Use feature bullets. So as I said, this is basically what the optimized press, one of the first sections, looks like now. And this is basically just feature bullets showing the main benefits and features of optimized press with some nice icons alongside. Pretty simple to do. It doesn't take very long to write those out. And you just help people focus on the initial benefits of, of the product without actually having to read too in depth. It's very much more like a summary. Um, works really well. Another thing we did, um, this is an example from Basecamp, but we've actually just done this with Optimize Press. And this is basically, if you get some high profile people in your market using your software, make sure you, you, you publicize that on your site. We put up pictures with James, Frank Kern, Trey Smith, some of the users of Optimize Press on our page. As soon as we did that, we had a 20 to 30% boost in, uh, in conversion rate. So it's not insignificant. There's a reason that people like Basecamp, who test everything, the reason they're doing this is because it works really well. So if you've got, as soon as you find that someone in your market is using it that's, you know, that's well known, get their, get their face up there, get a testimonial from them if you can, but just get, get them up there um, with their, you know, their face. Have a look on the Optimized Press site, you'll see exactly what I mean. Um, and you should go out and try and get these people to use your software if you can. So when you've got this software ready, just send them a copy of your software. Don't just send them an email saying, oh, I want you to check out my software. You know, they, don't, they shouldn't have to do anything apart from just click a link and download it or get access to it. So send them login straight away. Don't give them an extra step because the majority of people I know, um, you know, their time is precious. So you need to make it as easy as possible for them to check out your software. So that's one of the first things I would do if I was going into a new market with a new piece of software is send it to the, the leading guys in that market. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the instant upsell. So this is an easy way for you to instantly add value um, and increase your sales. So there's two things you can do to actually instantly make more money from your product. You can offer a developer or a commercial license for your product. So what I mean by that is you can, if you offer it for single use, you can then say, okay, well, for an extra 77 bucks, you can actually use it for client sites, or you can use it on three sites rather than one site. So multi-user licenses, developer licenses. We did this with Optimized Press for a while. We've now switched the system slightly. We're testing a few different things, but this worked really well, uh, and we got many people that jumped on that initially with the developer license system. And you don't have to do any extra work, really. The only work you might have to do is when you're initially developing the licensing system. You want them to make it so they can actually um, check if it's one site or three sites or however many you want to do. So bear that in mind when you're actually creating the thing at the start. But this is an easy way to add value. Or a, a alternative to that is a premium or a pro version. So when you come to develop your software, if you've got a few ideas for a few extra features, rather than build them into the main software, if they're not core features that really need to be in the main software, create a pro version with these extra features and then sell that on the, on the uh, back end. So when someone buys, you basically either take the payment and then present them with the upsell, or you can have it as a tick box on the, sale, on the actual checkout page for them to instantly add the premium version for sort of a minimal extra amount. And many people will take you up on this. Um, we haven't done it yet with Optimized Press because we're working on a few new things, but I know of many people in the same sort of market that I am that have done this, and they've added 30 to 50 percent, sorry, no, 50 to 100 percent in sales. So, you know, you can double your profits, essentially. Okay, so one of the final things I want to talk about is managing your business. So this is basically some of the main ways to actually make sure that your software business is running smoothly and the best ways to really handle things. So you need a help desk. If you're not already using a help desk because you, you don't find that there's demand for it in your business at the moment, if you release software, you will need a help desk. We, we can get up to 50 tickets a day in our help desk, which sounds like a lot, but you know, I think because of the nature of Optimized Press, we do tend to got, get a lot of general questions. But with, with, a, with hindsight and building a lot of these features into the software, a lot of that would be, would be removed because a lot of these people are people that have never upgraded. So. Um, you're going to need a help desk. I recommend Zendesk, or we use Groove HQ, which is a new software that's just in beta version at the moment. 
um, but you, it's going to help you centralize all your, your software um, or your support um, rather than handling it with email which is unreliable you really want to make sure that you actually um, have it all centralized and it helps if you've got a team in place um, this is going to help them to see what you know what's been answered and what's what's outstanding if you've got more than one person answering support you can't really do that without a help desk you should listen to your help desk as well you know many of our best feature ideas um, and feedback comes from our help desk so make sure that whoever's manning your help desk whether that's yourself or an, an outsourced team member or someone else in-house make sure that any kind of feature requests or any kind of main issues that are coming through they should really be given some high priority like James the whole idea of this event James has been saying is you know lifetime value of customers we want to make sure that by doing things like this and listening to your help desk you can help enhance the lifetime value of your customers by you know listening to exactly what they're saying reacting to that responding to that I'm not saying that every single feature that gets requested in your help desk you should add you have to have some kind of you know distinction between that but at least by answering them and saying, you know, okay, we'll be considering this, it, it's really going to help um, strengthen your relationship with your customers. Okay, so you want to try and deliver awesome to every single customer. We try and do this. Um, hopefully, we succeed in the majority. So it's really a case of making sure that your support staff go that extra mile to actually help your customers whenever they can and really, you know, listen to what they're saying um, and really you know you need to make sure that if customers are um, asking questions we get a lot of questions for things like WordPress um, plugins and things that are not working with optimized press and what we try and do as much as possible is help them with that question many other companies um, will just say go to the plugin company we don't care but you know generally we try and help fix those issues if we can or at least do you know if it's something wrong with our system we'll try and fix it if you try and fob people off, you know, you're not going to build a relationship with them. They're going to, they're going to you know, think twice before they buy the next thing that you promote. or you know, it's, not, it's not going to be quite as strong. A few other things you can do. Um, I always recommend having a knowledge base in your, in your help desk. Now, if you use Zendesk or the uh, Groove HQ, they allow you to build a knowledge base within the system. And that basically is just a, an archive of almost like FAQ questions. So whenever you get a question that seems to be cropping up quite a few times in your, in your help desk, you should create an FAQ article for it because by doing that, you'll find that um, you'll get that question less and less because people, not everyone, but some people will check the FAQ first. So make sure you have an FAQ section and also create like a fast start section. If you can create some kind of fast start guide or, or getting started guide for your product, either have that in the help desk or in the initial training of your software, you're going to find that that um, reduces your support a lot because people, you know, they want to know how to get started with your software as easily as possible. So I recommend that have, having a fast start guide, something like that, is really going to reduce your support. We did this with Optimize Press and noticed a, a big reduction in support that we were getting. Okay, so. I recommend that you also create a support funnel. This is something that we're just rolling out with Optimize Press now. And what I mean by this is basically creating a, a funnel in which your customers have to go through to actually um, get answers. Because what you'll find is that people will come to your help desk and they'll just instantly click send an email. They'll look for that email link wherever it is. Now, I'm not saying you should make it really hard for customers to contact you, but if you just put an extra step in place where you're saying, well, either what's your question, um, you know, and that searches the knowledge base before they have to submit a ticket, you're going to reduce the, the support burden a hell of a lot by doing that. You can do this with Zendesk, um, and you, you're going to be able to do it with Groove HQ pretty shortly as well, I believe. And basically what you want to be doing is having a system where you can actually ask them, what's your problem? And that question will actually search the knowledge base. And if you're adding questions regularly to the knowledge base from your help desk, you'll find that probably 80% of questions can be answered right there without even submitting a ticket. So it's all about helping your customers self-serve themselves, so helping them support themselves with your software. You shouldn't make it too hard to actually contact you. We, we tried um, for a while. Um, we'd switch things around a little bit, and the, the contact link, 
people were finding it too hard to find, and we, we actually got a few refunds because people were finding it was, you know, I, couldn't, I didn't know how to contact you. And so don't hide your support links completely, but adding that extra step, we found in our tests so far, it, it really helps reduce support, and it doesn't actually impact on your customer's experience. So take them through a training process. And I believe this is the screenshot of the new Optimize Press support site that we're, we're launching, and this is basically... Um, you can see on the front end there, we've got basically the four main areas that people want to ask questions. So if they've got login issues, if they've got uh, problems with you know, troubleshooting issues, and that takes them through a step-by-step -step process. So when they click troubleshooting, it will say, okay, is your question related to this, 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 and this? And we base that on the common questions that we've had with Optimized Press in the past. Also, if you can add some kind of top 20 questions or top 20, top 20 sort of uh, FAQ links, that's a really great way of helping support as well. I know that 37 Signals, the guy that's, that create Basecamp, they actually do this as well, and it, it works really well. So having those kind of like built-in question lists is really helpful. I wouldn't be afraid to blacklist your customers. Now, what I mean by this is that you'll always get some shitty customers that basically complain about anything, cause your help desk a lot of support, are rude to your help desk, or just generally, you know, are pretty much arseholes. Um, I, I, you know, we regularly, well, not regularly, but you know, probably once a month we'll refund someone because we just find that they're causing too much hassle and we'll do it in a polite way, but you know, basically those people are never surprised when you do it because they know they've been an asshole to you, you know, so just don't, don't bother about the one sale. I'm not saying you shouldn't help people unless you've really cocked up and then, you know, you should try and repair that, but if people are just being, you know, downright rude, difficult, don't be afraid to blacklist them. Okay, one of the final things I want to talk about is actually protecting your product. So many people are worried about their product being ripped off. We've had ours ripped off quite a few times. It's on many of the wearer's sites and things like that, which some people say is like, uh, you know, you should be proud of that. But um, there's a few things you can do to help reduce this. One of the first things, well, one of the things we did which was most effective was signing up to a site, dmca.com. It's $10 a month, and they give you a little badge that goes on your site. Now, it's, uh, I was surprised at this, but we reduced the piracy of our, our product by around about 75% by adding this to the site. Now, whether that was just a coincidence, in, you know, but since then we've had you know, a massive reduction in the amount of times we found our s software being... Uh, being pirated. Now, what DMCA is, is basically the, I don't know the legal whatever, but basically it's the um, Copyright Act which protects software. Um, it's mainly in the US, but it generally applies worldwide, and most of the times when people host your stuff, they'll host it on servers which are actually hosted in the US. And what you can do with DMCA.com, as well as having the badge on your site, it has like a, a system where you can basically say where your site, where you found the link to your site, and um, sorry, to your product to be downloaded, and it creates like a legal document for you, which you can then send to the host of that file, and they'll take the file down. We we actually found Optimize Press on a site like Fiverr, one of these kind of Fiverr ripoff sites, and we emailed the host, and the whole site was taken down within 24 hours. Not just our page with our things, so they do have to take action on it. Um, the other thing to do, and someone already mentioned this, is Google Alerts. You should set up Google Alerts for all your product names, and also um, with something like Get, because a lot of people search for Get and then the product name. Um, so make sure you, you add those kind of search terms in there. You'll generally find your product being hosted on sites like FileServe and RapidShare and sites like this. So you can add those kind of search, so RapidShare, product name, things like that. And you'll generally, it will ping up within 24 hours if your product's actually been uploaded to one of those sites. You can then email them directly and they'll take down the, site, take down the actual file. You, you're never going to be able to 100% protect your product and I don't recommend you spend all day worrying about it, but you, know, you, should, you should at least take some steps. So, generating future ideas. So, basically, there's a few ways that you can generate future ideas for products. One of the first ones is obviously surveying your audience. So, ask, you know, SurveyMonkey, things like that. You can send 
or, uh, surveys to your list, asking them what features they'd like. You can also, if you've got some kind of a forum, you can ask them on there. You can use Facebook, like Jen said, ask questions. The only problem with Facebook is obviously it's publicly seen by your competitors, so you might want to bear that in mind um, if you're asking questions about new features there. Um, have a feature request function within your help desk as well. So have an option there for people to actually submit questions, um, sorry, feature requests. So if they've got an idea, get them to send it you in. Um, and consider one thing we've done, um, which has worked really well, is we created language packs for Optimized Press, which we haven't translated the whole theme, but we created versions of the buttons and basically the essentials you needed to build a site with Optimized Press in certain other languages, so Spanish, German, French. Um, I know Andy does a lot of work with um, versions of ClickBank products in different languages. Um, it's a huge market. There's, there's rising markets in Spanish markets is getting really big, German markets. So you can look at m taking your product and putting it into those, those, other, those other markets. We've actually had people from Russia, I Italy, places like that, all want to actually launch Optimized Press in their country. Uh, it's something we'll probably look at more in, in the future, but it's, it's an easy way. You know, all you have to do is, you, your customers will do it for you, essentially, because people will ask you, you know, can we have the buttons translated? Can we have this translated? Can we have that translated? If you can do it um, and you get in demand for it, then it's worth doing, and we've had quite a few sales as a result of that. And that is pretty much it. One last thing. Um, the book Rework by the guys from 37 Signals, they always say sell your byproducts. So as you're creating your product, you want to make sure that you're noting down ideas that you come up with, because you'll probably think of other ideas along the way. We certainly came up with three or four other ideas for products along the way of creating optimized press. So think of how you can actually create products out of those ideas. Um, and you know, by doing that, listen to your audience and surveying them and taking these other things on board, you can pretty much come up with an endless stream of ideas for software products. And that is pretty much it. Anyone got any questions? No questions? Hello. You should ask questions while he's here because he's traveled <laughs> from the other side of the world. <laughs> Hi. Let's just say I was a bit silly and ignored the first rule you've got there um, that there was already an inset market leader and we're now like seven or eight months down the track and we're not doing really well. Even though we know it's a market that sells really well, would you drop it? So you've, you've got a product that you're already working yeah, on? Yeah, well no, it's, it's finished and it's been out there for yeah, almost a year. I know you're finding that it's not, it's not really selling. Nah, even though like you know, all the feedback we get is that it's better than the market leader. It's just we c he's got more affiliates than we have users. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you really differentiating yourself from that product, or yeah, are you well, kind of just along the same lines with your marketing? Yeah, it's getting closer because basically he's got a copy of it and flogs all our features and puts them in. Yeah, yeah, we've had that um, happen as well. Yeah, so we still are better in most ways, but. Like it, the differentiation is getting smaller. It's tricky. I think one of one of the ways you could do it, but it depends on who's promoting his software already. Is is like I said, try and get your software in the hands of some of the market leaders um, that aren't, you know, obviously that either aren't promoting him or even if they are, if you can show them that your product's better and they can switch, then that could be a great way to get a boost because what you'll find with affiliates and you know bigger JVs is that once you get a few higher level people, you know, if once I had James promote my product a lot of the people who are in, on his list are also affiliates. So they then take it on board and say, oh, well, if James is promoting it, I'll promote it. And you only have to have a few people like that that take it on board and start promoting, and you'll, you'll see like the trickle effect down. Yeah. So I would see if you could, you could maybe find someone, you know, I don't know what market you're in or whatever, but see if you can find someone in. Yeah. Oh, it's content creation. It's an article spinner. OK. But, um, yeah, like we've already had a crack at a lot of the people who you know, the, these big guys, potential JVs, but they're all so inset with the best spinner that, you know, they, don't, they know it works, they know it converts, they don't want to change. Yeah, it's difficult to get them yeah. to change. Mm. Uh, spin chimp. 
chimp, C-H-I-M-P. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. If you can't, you know, this is why we have it in there. I know it's not helpful now. Yeah. Um, because it is difficult if there's a market leader there to, for these exact reasons. Um, I'll have a think. Come and find yeah. me. I'll have yeah, a no think to see if I can think of anything else Cheers. for you. Thanks for the cool presentation, James. My name is Gideon. Thanks, Gideon. James, uh, just I have two questions. The one is, if you had to do this again, what would you do different? And in other words, uh, what sort of painful mistakes would you make, uh, and how would you do things different? That's the first question. Okay. And okay. So go for that first. Yeah. Yeah, I'll go for that one first. All right. So one of the first things, um, I probably wouldn't go to the Philippines to program the system. Um, I mean, it worked at the time because of the, you know, the, the cost was a lot lower. Um, but the, the problem was um, that some of the code in Optimized Press, and I know a few people have mentioned this that have been here, some of the code, if you're trying to work uh, from a developer standpoint, it's, tr it's tricky. Um, so I would probably go to a higher level programmer where we know that we're going to get a quality finished product um, without you know, too many bugs in there from the start. That was probably the major thing because that also sort of then cascades onto support issues, um, you know, which is a major part of our business. I reckon if we'd started with someone who you know, really knew WordPress inside out from the start, then we probably would have had less support further down the line with compatibility issues. So, so for these programmers from the Philippines, were they A player programmers or were they just people you found through Odesk, for example? They, we found them through Odesk. Um, they, they weren't bad programmers, but I think they just what we, we essentially had three programmers before we find the final guy for Optimized Press. And because of that, you know, the code, there was people trying to work with each other's code and things, so it got pretty messy. Um, but we were too far down the line to kind of get back to the start. And what we found, because when we launched, there wasn't really a lot of products out there like that, it was very hard to get them to understand what we wanted. Whereas I think in the UK, the US, Australia, those kind of uh, markets where people have a better understanding uh, especially if you can find someone who's got a bit of an understanding of the marketing world as well, um, you'd probably get a better product with you know, less development time. So. Sorry, there was actually three questions. The final question <laughs> I have is you've, uh, you've had a million dollar business in the last, or in the first 10 months of uh, Optimized Press, which is pretty awesome. What do you think you need to do to take that to a $10 million business? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> hmm. I think the thing that we're, we're looking, I don't want to obviously give away everything, but um, the thing that we're kind of looking at now is, like I mentioned, there's byproducts that we've kind of come up with ideas from so that, plug, that, that could almost plug into to optimize press. So that's one thing, you know, we can probably build in things like the Pro version is something which could probably double our revenue. I'm pretty confident of that on its own. Um, and you know, really going out there and finding, um, I think just, yeah, <laughs> the, um, like would probably you, the byproducts thing, I would think. Would you consider things like getting investors on board or things, that sort of thing, or would you just keep it all within your own business? I don't know, really. I think investors, I'd, probably not something that I'd want to go down the road of doing. But I think you know I'm I'm keen on creating more products around that optimized press brand and building it more. You know we've got a solid brand on its own now. You know if we could build out more products within that brand, maybe taking the product itself and applying it to a slightly different market. So at the moment we're focused on internet marketing and people like that. But we don't really, although local businesses use it, we don't really have a version that's for that sort of market. So probably taking the framework. Uh, reworking it and then applying it to another market so we almost have a completely separate revenue stream. Um, not that we want to compete with things like thesis and things like that, but I think there's a market. You know, people buy more than one WordPress theme at the end of the day. Um, so, you know, we could, if we had another product out there that was kind of slightly different market angle, I think you could almost create another business alongside that that would probably double the revenue at least. Cool, thanks. Thanks, Gideon. All right. Okay, that's it for the questions. I think that was a wonderful presentation. Yeah. Cheers, buddy. Dyson always delivers. <laughs>